you have to show the competence in the role that you're doing, but also be interested outside of what's the day to day for you. So yes, you, you've got to do your job well. You've got to be competent, but also start understanding the broader picture of the business. Hello and welcome to Becoming the Influential Me. I'm Michelle Chikander and today I have something really exciting I want to share with you. Um, in my line of work, I, had, I get to have conversations with some incredible minds, you know, these leaders in business and we get to talk about all, these, all things career, all things business and I would like to give you access to some of these conversations. Which is why today, ladies and gentlemen, I'd love to introduce you to the new series on this podcast called the mentor edition in this series i'm going to be interviewing successful women in the corporate world and you know really helping to break down how they did it your job like me is to take notes and squeeze out as much wisdom as possible and to use it this is the most important part use it <laughs> what are we going to be talking about well we're going to be busting myths about what it takes to succeed in business and in your career as a woman we're going to be getting the scoop on how to navigate everything as a wife as a mother as a woman etc etc really going beyond the generic conversations about success also, we're going to be sharing with you some super practical ways to shortcut your success through learning from their experiences. So make sure you do not skip a beat on this new series. With that said, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe because there's going to be so much juice you do not want to miss it. Today, to kick things off, I am going to be speaking to Helen Roberts. Um, she is the CEO of Robinson's Group PLC. The reason why I think you should really, really pay attention to this woman is because she's a force of nature. Of course, you have to be a force of nature to get to, you know, a PLC at uh, the CEO level in a, in a in a in a in a global business. But that's not the point. The point is, Helen is so impressive because she manages to do to defy convention. I guess is the best way to put it. She defies convention because that society sometimes places limitations on on us, and she, throughout her career and perhaps her life, has chosen to just frankly ignore all of, the, all of those conventions. Convention number one, left brain, right brain. If you are a scientific person, that means it's very difficult for you to, you know, do the whole people creativity side. Well, not for Helen. Helen was a scientist and or an engineer and, you know, being a woman in STEM, went on to do a PhD in, in materials engineering. And from there, skipped on out to marketing. <laughs> Convention number two, if you are a woman marketer, it is virtually impossible to get to CEO level because the CEO is often succeeded by the CFO or the COO. Almost never is it the CMO or somebody coming from the softer side of the business, shall we say. Not for Helen, she did it. Thirdly, if you are a high level executive in, in a huge corporation, it is impossible for you to have a family. Not for Helen. This woman is a, she's a mother and she's a wife and she talks about, you know, how she managed to defy that convention too, minus the guilt. I am so, so thrilled about this episode and I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed speaking to Helen and you learn almost as much as I did from, from, from Helen. Here she is. Helen, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited about having a chat with you, not just for my own curiosity, but also for the curiosity of our listeners as well. So let's dive straight in. And I'm going to hit you with an assumption straight away. You're a CEO of a publicly listed company. You've worked for some major brands. This obviously means you are a um, public school child. You know, you went to private school. Your parents were extremely wealthy and you had incredible co co connections, right? <laughs> Um, no, and I don't think that necessarily, you know, that I think we all come from different walks of life. And I think it's really important that 
you know, you get a certain direction and you find your way through life. That's not all about just being given every advantage earlier on. Although I was very fortunate. I had very supportive parents and I grew up in a, you know, in a time and a place where um, I felt that I could achieve what I wanted to achieve. So I haven't felt those natural blockers, external blockers. It's really been up to me. So, and I think that's the most important thing. It's up to ourselves to do what we want to do and to make what we want to make of ourselves. Absolutely. And tell me a little bit about uh, your your mum in this equation. You grew up and had a very, as you mentioned to me, and had a very normal, in quotes, upbringing. But tell me a little bit about how, about your mother and the experience you had of, of watching her as you were growing up. I suppose, well, I look, I grew up in the 70s, so a long time ago, um, and it wasn't particularly usual for both parents to work. In, at that time um, and I just remember my mother really being so effective at um, balancing work and life she worked full-time she had a very you know um, a very important job in the NHS um, and she managed that without me losing out anything in my childhood and and I think that sort of role model that you see where you know the ability to cope and to juggle all of those balls um, so effective when the networks weren't so established, you know, nurseries didn't necessarily exist in those days. So, you know, managing that with, with two young children um, was really impressive. And I think I grew up with that's normal. You know, it's normal to have that resilience, to manage things, to cope when, you know, one of your children's sick and you, you know, you're still going to manage work and balance it. And you can do that. And it, and it is possible. So I think she taught me a lot about doing that. And at the same time, just really um, enjoying life at the same time. We're not too difficult. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, going on from that, you grow up with a working mum. You know, you're seeing all these examples of juggling and of ambition and of somebody not allowing, quote unquote, society's boundaries to limit them in what they wanted yeah. to do. Which, you know, is, is, is incredible, especially at that time. And then you, you know, you do your schooling and your passion is science. Yes. So through school, uh, I would say humanities like geography um, and science. I was more I was I was better at maths and science than I ever was at creative writing and, and English and languages. So, you know, that, that's my natural leaning. But probably the thing that brought all of that together is just interest in people. So when I talk about geography, I wasn't, you know, so interested in sedimentary rocks. I was more interested in about third world development or the developing world or the north south divide. You know, that whole area about, you know, how we as people have evolved and what does progress really look like? You know, so that whole sort of area of what was then sustainability and population uh, was really interesting to me. So that's really my core interest at school, I would say. And when you left school at uh, 18, I guess, when you finished school, what did you, what were your ambitions at this point? When I first left school, so I was going to do um, politics, philosophy and economics at university, but I took a year out and I'm really glad I did that. Again, it was quite unusual in the 80s to do that. Not everybody took a gap year. Uh, and I'm glad that, you know, people are doing that these days. Because I think when you're in school, you learn about the sort of classic careers um, that you can do the professional careers or otherwise um, but you don't get that breadth to really understand how your skills and your interests can relate into a career so um, you know for me having taken that step back going out into the real world you know packing shelves working at tills traveling um, so I worked for a tourist company I was a travel rep uh, in Greece and you meet, you know, a phenomenal number and range and diversity of people. Um, and I think, you know, it allows you the time to mature and really think about what you want to do. And I think, you know, when we were talking, Michelle, um, you meet people through your life and just those conversations that you have that are so instrumental in making you think differently. And they have, they're like a milestone in your life. Mm -hmm. um, I met a gentleman who worked for, for Ford. And he was really helpful for me to think, why was I doing 
the subjects I was planning to do at university um, and what perhaps would be other career paths that I could take. And actually, I, I completely changed um, and went on to study engineering, materials engineering at university. And the thing I loved about materials engineering is, yes, I, you know, I was good at the science, mm -hmm. but I wasn't interested in science for its own sake. I was interested in science because materials are all around us. They impact our lives, you know, whether it's in a positive way or in a responsibility way, as we're talking about, you know, plastics at the moment yeah. um, and, you know, plastics is sort of being in our environment and, and the waste when it, they could so easily be reused back in that whole area for me, that whole area around circular economy is incredibly interesting, um, you know, on a very macro level. So I think what materials engineering gave me was a really good base and platform, a foundation for which, you know, to understand how I could take my career forward. So even if I didn't want to be a, a technician or, you know, an engineer uh, throughout my whole career, which I haven't been. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to go into the unconventionality of your career choices in a moment, but let's talk about this, uh, this encounter with this person. You are on your gap year. And was this an arranged meeting? Or was this somebody that you just met and have, had a spontaneous conversation with? And why did you allow this one individual to change the course of your career effectively? Uh, completely spontaneous over a cup of tea on a boat. Um, <laughs> so absolutely not planned at all, just happened to be talking. And I think being really open and finding out about people, you know, what did he enjoy about his career? You know, he, he'd been working for 20, 30 years, very senior in his role. You know, how did he make the choices and, and why? And what had he learned? What had he learned throughout his career when I was right at the beginning of mine? So, um, and I think that's really important. There are people around you who have gone through perhaps the same thought processes, through the same milestones in their lives, and just talking through, you might not choose to be the same as them. Often you won't, but it will make you think about what's right for you, what's also wrong for you. Um, so that conversation didn't necessarily just steer me. What it made me do is to look into other areas, to look in areas like engineering and find out what do you actually study in engineering at university? Because you don't study it at school. It's not like saying, I'm doing chemistry at school and I want to do chemistry at university. And it's just a progression of more detail and you know a, a further advanced level. It's a completely different subject. Is it really what I want to do? You know, it, do I really enjoy? Am I going to get the passion from that? You're going to spend three years of your life. And the one thing I would say is spend that time in things that you are passionate about and you really enjoy, because otherwise it can be pretty, you know. It can be a real drudge. Absolutely. And so you you then went into study materials engineering and talk to me about being a woman in in that environment. Did it did it matter? What was the experience like? Um, you have a well. When I was at um, engineering in the school in the engineering school, we had about one hundred and fifty two students, and three of us were women. So the ratio was hugely skewed towards you guys students. were the dot on the domino <laughs> yeah, we were the tiny dots and very noticeable when you don't turn up at lectures yeah it's really noticeable you can't get away with that you know the night out clubbing and and sloping in late because you were really obvious mm. um so um I think you do work really hard to prove to be there subconsciously and I never felt I personally never felt I, an imposter I never felt as if I shouldn't be there you know the the three girls that were on that course we all went on to do PhDs um, you know and study for another three years and probably another reason for having a year out gave me that you know that persistence in 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 wanting to carry on and study for another three years um, and you know so so I think we're all very focused wanting to do well and be ambitious um, and we didn't take it for granted. Absolutely, there's a, there's a certain element of you know having uh, some response of personal responsibility. Yeah, you know, you, you had all taken the hard path by many standards, um, and you decided all three of you to see it through. And I think that is incredible. 
So then you go into your career um, and you were, you, you tell us a little bit about that, the decision to then, you know, take what job and, and what happened in, in the earlier stages of your career. I think what you realise, I, I did my PhD, I was actually very fortunate. I was sponsored by a company called ICI, uh, which in those days used to make things like Geolix paint and a ha- very heavy industry up in the northeast of England. And they kindly sponsored me, which you know made it financially um, a lot easier. But it also gave me a huge amount of insight. So my PhD was very practically based. It was for a real product that eventually went into that. We developed a new product for the car industry for what was on Volvo cars at the time, many years ago. And it was at a time when cars were moving from being all completely all metal and glass to more introduction of plastics into you know, car engines and, and other parts of cars. And um, I think the, the two things there, it taught me a lot about um, detail managing projects, but that project was, three and a half years long and it taught me that perhaps you know if I spend my whole career on projects that take three and a half years I might work on eight things in my life (laughs) and that wasn't for me and and almost when I was looking for roles and and eventually I was recruited um, by Marks and Spencers I went to work for M&S the great thing about that was it was all about the consumer again it was all back to people and what relevance and I worked for M&S Foods you know finally I worked for them for 14 years because my roles kept on changing I was challenged I was working with some really bright people that I was learning from and I think that's the important thing when you're in a in your career you know is to constantly learn to go into work and add something more into your brain and I think the day when you don't Mm -hmm. is the day when you think do you know what I need to change I need to do something perhaps a little bit, you know, different that will carry on that development of me as a person. Because a lot of people do spend a long time in one company in their careers. And are you <coughs> essentially saying there's nothing wrong with that insofar as you Absolutely are not. and you are st- stretched and you are growing? If you're in one organisation, that's not a problem. If you're given the space to grow, it, it makes no difference. If you spend your whole career in one company or your whole career moving from companies, it's, it's having that ability to, for me, it was having the ability to progress. You know, I spent my first six years of MS actually in Asia, um, based out of Hong Kong. And I spent in hundreds, thousands of factories, um, you know, with a myriad of people and understanding how you communicate effectively with such a diverse, broad church of people. Mm. Um, and how to do that effectively and how to get you know the most out of people and how to work in the most collaborative way um for people to understand you know many of the people you worked with you're you're making a a a basket that's eventually going to hold a hamper for somebody as a Christmas present you know which you may never have seen a Marks and Spencer shop what it means what does quality mean to Mm. M&S Foods you know and, and you need to you know, you need to be able to describe that to people to make it really relevant to them. So they understand the context of what they're doing and why they're doing it. So I think I've always taken that through my career with the people I've worked with. Hmm. And in e- at each stage of your career, you obviously progressed. Um, how did you manage to find those opportunities? You know, because insofar as, you know, you say that the company had, you know, allowed you to grow and whatever, there was an element of you having to spot those opportunities and move into them. How did you find those, those opportunities? I think it, whether you're finding an opportunity within the company that you're, you know, that you're working within or you're moving to a new job role within a new company, it's down to you. Mm. And to say, right, OK, I've been doing this role for X amount of time. You know, what do I want to do next? And, and I haven't had a fixed road plan to say, right, this is where I want to get to. But I've always thought not just the immediate short term and one day after another. I think you do have to think through, right, you know, what ultimately would I like to do? And, and how, what's the best way of getting there? And can I do that within this business? Um, do I have to move businesses or what roles do I have to move to? So sometimes you have to move yeah, a little bit out of your comfort zone as well. You know, there were times in my career when I've made a, um, a, a career move. So when I moved from um, a marketing role where, you know, at the end of the day, I was leading a team, but I was the subject matter expert in that, in, in that, um, in my knowledge. 
to suddenly going to being a managing director of a £120 million pound business uh, covering the UK and covering Australia, which was, um, you know, geographically doesn't make sense, but market-wise and customer-wise really makes sense because the Australian and the UK markets are, are, are very similar to each other. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of analogy between the two. So you understand that there's a lot of um, common suppliers within that supply base. So it kind of makes sense on that level. But going into an MD role, you realise, you know, I'm not the subject matter expert. Now I need to understand where my gaps are. And I don't have to fill all those gaps myself. There are people who are really capable within my team. And what level of capabilities do you need to build that knowledge? So you collectively as a team, you have the full package. And I, and I think that's really important. Absolutely. So this, I, I really want to talk about this moment because this is a big moment. You want to go from a marketing role into a, you know, a, an MD role. So you are now, as you said, no longer a, a subject matter expert who knows all things marketing. You now have to know all things everything yes. uh, in the organization. How did you position yourself for this role? How did this role even make sense for you? Because, you know, as you go for roles, there are certain people that are in the line of succession normally. And I have to say in the line of succession, the marketing person is not always number one on that list. In fact, they usually aren't on the list. So, so t tell me how you positioned yourself for this role. Um, I think there's a number of things. One, when you are in the role that you're in, so I was in a marketing role, and like you say, it's, it's, not, it's not a normal jump. You normally come from a sales and commercial background. Sometimes people come from operational financial backgrounds as well. Um, I think you have to show the competence in the role that you're doing, but also be interested outside of what's the day-to-day -day for you. So yes, you've, you've got to do your job well. You've got to be competent. But also start understanding the broader picture of the business. Start understanding the, you know, the, have that business awareness. What, what are the levers that other MDs that you're working with um, are trying to pull to improve the business? And it's always about business improvement, year on year, incremental improvement. You know, how do you do that? Then there are a number of different um levers that you can actually pull and giving some support to your colleagues to doing that take on some of that work say can I do this and that maybe that will help us get the the sales growth that we need to get so softly working closely with people but being interested beyond your own four walls absolutely so this idea of doing two jobs right the job yeah. number and being your actual what's on your job description and you know be doing that at a really high level doing that well and then the other job is saying okay now I've got to step into the role that I want in the future yeah so so having a, your eye on two different prizes so to speak okay and and how did you where did you did, did you learn that you know how did you get this this mindset because like I mentioned to you before most people are like okay I'm at work I'm just going to do my job and what's the gossip and you know I've just got to get to six o'clock or whatever time you finish work um, how did you learn this mindset of you know uh, you know having this strategy um I think I've always learned probably most of what I've learned in my career is from other people so you know when you're young in your career watch other people what they're doing see what make works well for them some of it also see what work, what works doesn't work well. You know, the kind of manager, the kind of leader that you want to be, um, you know, you will see role models ahead of you. You'll have that line manager that you report into and you loved working with them. Try and understand what is it that you, you personally loved? What made them such a good leader from your perspective? And there'll be times when people are terrible leaders and managers of people. They might be great at their job, but that doesn't mean to say they're always going to be a really good people manager mm. and understand what style works best for you. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to be authentic. You can't just you know copy somebody else's style. It's got to be authentic to you. But start to think about your impact on others and understanding how you do something, how you communicate something, how you engage people 
is so much more important than perhaps the content of what you're saying. 100%. I'm not saying it's not relevant. Of course, it's relevant, the content, but it's it's about, you know, it's 20% of it. The 80% of it really is about how you're saying something and how you're making that other person feel or react to what you're saying. So I think for me, um, watching, you know, I've had some great people throughout my career who have been hugely helpful, mentors um, that I've gone to and said, look, I don't know the answer. This is what I'm thinking. Uh, This is, you know, my approach. And they've been really good to challenge me to say, well, have you thought about or, you know, um, give me some ways of broadening my thinking beyond just the right. This is X, therefore I'm going to do Y. Okay. Actually, it's it's important to take the time than just always reacting to things immediately, to think through it perhaps and and just reflect before you do act, and then I think you get to a better place at the end. And in some ways, it can be more time efficient to do it that way because you're not doing it again and again. It's not but the trial and error approach. But it's, 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 it requires a certain level of vulnerability, right? To say, okay, I'm no, under no illusions that my thinking, it seems fairly obvious, but I'm no, under no illusions that my thinking is not flawless, right? It's, in, it's not infallible. Yeah. Um, and you go to somebody saying, I don't know how to do this, or I don't know how this has got to work. Um, what gives you the confidence to do that? Or what gave you the confidence to do that? Because some people might be like, oh, I don't want to look like I'm not good at my job. I don't want to look like I'm failing or, you know, I don't want to do look like I don't know what I'm doing because then I won't get the promotion. So talk us through that, those, that, that dichotomy. Look, vulnerability is not a bad thing. Admitting that you don't know the whole picture or you need help is a real strength. It's it's not it's it's not it's not about being vulnerable. You are not going to be perfect every single time and know exactly every aspect of whatever whatever it is that you're you know you're thinking about. And searching out to you know keep, talk to other people, you know, bounce ideas off. I think the important thing is to not go to somebody else and say, I don't know how to fix something. The important thing is to say, I've got a problem and I've thought about X, Y and Z. And I think Z is the right way to go because of whatever reasons you have. So I think it's important you have the thinking. Yeah. And I think it's important you put that that effort in. Um, But being able to talk through with somebody who can be that sort of, you know, that you know, that that challenger is quite important and nobody will ever see you as being a weaker person for having done that. I think people will see that as, I would see that as a point of strength. If anybody in my team came and wanted to chat through, um, I would only be too happy to give the time, you know, and, and I've had a number of people who, are, you know, I don't work with at all, but have approached me on whether it's LinkedIn or, you know, by email you know, a student from Loughborough University who spent half an hour just talking to me. Um, and, you know, I just hopefully gave her some different ways of thinking. Mm. Having that, you know, this, the, the, um, the energy and the, the wherewithal to reach out to other people, you'll only grow from doing that. Um, you know, and we'll all, we'll all learn from mistakes, but if you can kind of try and preempt those mistakes to start with, um, you still have mistakes. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. We, we, none of us are perfect. You know, none of us have got all the knowledge. So sharing that and reaching out to other people was the way that I found incredibly helpful through my career. Amazing. Um, there, there was also, it, it's, it's about the richness, right, of your experience. And if you can have diversity of thought and diversity of experience coming together, then you have a far richer experience. That does not mean it's a perfect experience, but it'll be a richer experience. Yeah. Um, there's also something that you you told me about how you made room for yourself. And that was the idea that when you got recruited into the business, what did you do? You know, you had, you, you knew that, okay, I'm... I want to move from, from one aspect. I want to move from the marketing and I would like to do something commercial. And, and you knew that was your, your um, sorry, to, to, to go into leadership. You knew that that was your ultimate immediate goal. Yeah. Um, how, how did you position that? I was really clear, actually, in, even in my interview, 
it, it was a reasonably large company, 500 million turnover. So not huge, but big enough that there was scope there within the business. And even within the interview saying, you know, ultimately, I would love to get into more of a commercial PL, being responsible for a PL role mm-hmm. at some point, if that opportunity comes up and I've got the I show the capabilities to be able to do it, to shift into that. Um, so I think I think you've, you know, it's always good to be upfront and say, look, these are the areas that I would love to. It doesn't force you into doing that, you know, but it shows to people. I hear somebody who might think about that in the future. So when the opportunities do come up, you know, if you've got good successional planning, which we had in that business, um, and an HR, you know, director who is looking at those jigsaw pieces across the business, they'll remember those conversations. All that person said, you know, they would be quite interested to go. So make yourself available in that sense. Say, look, I would be, and what do I need to do in order to prepare for that? What's the best way of developing for that? You know, is there training that I need? Is there anybody I can spend time in with the business, within the business um, to learn from? What are the areas that perhaps I, you know, need to um, make sure I've got? Because, I, you know, I haven't had the exposure. So, you know, finance, finances, you know, would be an area that prior to that, I, yes, I had some, but but not a huge amount of exposure. So, you know, learning to read a PL, you know, properly, understanding what a balance sheet is, all of that stuff that, you know, is about business acumen or financial acumen. Um, so you can do that, you know, and you know, I spent time with the FD and said, you know, take me through our take me through our PL. You know, what does that mean? You know, there's a lot of jargon in it, and it's not the language that I'm you know using day to day. So um you can spend, you know, take up somebody's half an hour of their lunchtime. People are willing. Absolutely. You, know, you, have, you you had to take the initiative. You yeah. had to 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 make that happen for yourself. You didn't just wait for it to come to you or for somebody to speak just just to give you. Oh, we've got this magic opportunity. Here's it. Just unwrap it. That's all the work you have to do. <laughs> yeah, no. It wasn't like no, that. You have to put the effort in. Yeah, you have to take control. It's your it's your career. It's your you know. And and we're all different. Some people like doing the same role every day you know, of their lives. And that's what really drives them. They like being great at it. They know every aspect of it. They know every shortcut. They know who they need to work with. And they like the people they work with in that office. And, and that's for them. I, I guess I've always been very attracted to change throughout my career. Mm-hmm. And I'm very good at managing change when it's either I'm doing the change or it's being done to me. It's not something that I find particularly scary. This is good, but in order for you to be able to embrace change, um, you know, how do you deal with the prospect of failure? Because when you go into the unknown, it's not like, as you said, being in a role where you know what you're doing, it's almost impossible to fail because you've done it a million you know, times. But to going into a space where it could all go tits up, you know, in, in an instant, how do you, what's your relationship with failure? What do you think of failure when you're faced with, a big role. I mean, right now, for example, you're the CEO of a publicly listed company. You know, what are you, how do you, what's your relationship with failure? Um, you become more comfortable with it. I think <laughs> over time, yes, you become more comfortable and you realize that actually, yes, things will go wrong constantly. Pandemics hit. Yeah. Markets are volatile. Inflation happens. And I, I don't think you know, nobody's ever going to be in control of that. And I think the higher up you are in an organisation, you have to cope with the, um, it can be lonely because at the end of the day, you haven't got a set of, a, a team around you of peers that you can share that responsibility with, but you need to find a way of sharing that with other people, mm. um, being very open to it, and sometimes saying, right, what is the right course of action? What are the actions that we can now take? What can I do? And I think you have to learn what true resilience is. And resilience for me has always been um, understanding what's in your control and worrying about what's in your control, not what's out of your control. I can't change inflation. I can't change the markets. No, and you um, can't undo COVID. 
I can't undo COVID and the impact of COVID on, on our business. What, what I can try and do is to navigate the business through and to mitigate as much of that risk as I can um, or to put things right or to respond quickly mm. um, to putting things in place that will overcome that rather than worrying about what I can't change. And I think that's really, really important for people to realise. There's no point worrying about things that are out of your control. Absolutely, because they're just going to stay out of your control. Yeah. <laughs> Whether you worry or not, so you might as well get on with it. No, I, I completely agree. I want to shift gears slightly and talk about the fact that you are a normal human being. You are a wife, <laughs> a mother. <laughs> <You're not. laughs> um, yeah. you know, what, is, what is it? How do you... Uh, how do you balance? I, 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 that word is an awful word in a way because it's kind of, you get this image of you know yoga, you know managing everything, being successful. It's like, but actually, how do you how do you find balance in, in your way, man, navigating a career at a very high level and also family life? Um, I, I think it's about knowing what's really really important when family certainly come first. Um, and it's important for me as an individual. It's so important that I leave. I lead by that example because I've also got, you know, a team beneath me and beneath them. I've got people, and how I respond to myself is also reflects on that how they will respond because that kind of sets the culture, when and the culture does get set at the top, no matter how much um, you've got a great team below you. You, you, you know, the culture will come from the top. Um, so for me, you know, I'm very clear in terms of boundaries um, and I'm flexible. Of course, you have to be. You know, sometimes things happen and you you take a call or sometimes things happen at home and you take a call and you've, you know, your child is sick, you know, and, and you deal with that. I think I'm very lucky in that um, I have a huge amount of support from my husband. Mm -hmm. So between the two of us, it's a very fluid management between us in terms of, you know, how do we set those priorities and um, who manages when things kind of need to be done at home. Um, I think having a huge amount of resilience and persistence helps, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the amount of energy. You've got to be very energetic to because, you know, it, it's not a nine to five job. None of it's a nine to five job. So I, I enjoy that. Um, but um, I've always been really clear. And I think that comes back right round the loop to when we talked about my mother. My, I hope that my daughter will say when she's older, I never lost out on anything because my mother worked mm. the level that she worked and you know the career that she had. I'm proud of that. Um, because that gave me tremendous insight, but I didn't lose anything from my childhood in that. So it's always a, it, it is a balance. And it, it, you're right. It's a very overused word, but you have to get that balance right. And it's not just about being being in your role at work and, and being the mother. It's also about being you. So, you know, for me, exercise is always a big part of my time. And pre-COVID, you know, getting to the gym, I would just get up every morning at six o'clock and get that, you know, that time in at the gym before getting off to work or before everybody else was up in the household and the school run started. So um, I find that quite easy to do, you know, and, and, and that's where I created my space. And even through the COVID, I found, you know, obviously gyms were shut. And then I found my love of running. And actually running for me is one of those really peaceful times. I run with a dog. Two of us go off. We'll do one, my... there you go. Yeah. So I get him to walk, at, you know, I'm walking him at the same time. So it's still a job. But five kilometres and the two of us just running along. Um, even when it's raining and it's horrible weather and it's dark on a winter's morning, um, I still really enjoy it because that's reflection time. I don't think through things about work. I just free my mind and don't think I just listen to the music look around me and that's my reflection time and I think that that mindfulness is actually really important finding that space mm. where you do generally get that balance is important 
Yeah, and I guess it's about not waiting for that time to be given to you. It's you saying, I'm going to take ownership of my time. And yes, I can't do it at lunchtime or, you know, in the evening because I want to spend time with my child. And, you know, it's all this. It's you, you're saying, okay, the best time for this for this to happen for me is at 6 a.m. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's, that's really a, a powerful thing. How do you deal with the guilt that a lot of people um feel about the fact that they're not at home all the time and they're not at work all the time <laughs> you know when they're at home they think about work when they're at work they think about the, the, the house um I don't have that guilt uh, because that's at the end of the day beyond my control yeah and, uh, and I think um if I was a full-time mother I don't think I'd be particularly happy and if I was a full-time somebody at work and that's all I had in my life I would be happy I like having all those aspects. I like that richness to my life. I like that sometimes I'm talking about working one minute and then the next minute I could be having a discussion with my daughter about makeup yeah. because she's 10 and she's suddenly found makeup. You know, so I, I love that variety. I love that diversity of it. I, I would hate to think and I am doing the best I can. I don't sort of, you know, fall on my sword to say, I'm sure I could be a better mother. Honestly, I could probably be a better CEO. Of course I can um but I don't feel as if I, you know that 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 drive for perfection I think is important but I don't beat myself up because I am not perfect yeah and, and I think that is that is really the key it's about saying okay this is outside of my control and therefore I'm going to make the most of what is in my control um, yeah. And I love that. And I love what we talked about, about making space. Yeah. And um, there's, there's one last thing I would like us to talk about before I give you the floor to share your advice. And that is the idea of taking risks. You said to me that that is one of the keys to your, uh, to, to the, the consistent key, I guess, in your progression, in your career. Tell us about your relationship with risk. And I guess it comes down again to this idea of failure, but, but what risks have you taken and why? Um, Taking the CEO role, for example, is a big risk. Yeah. <laughs> so probably taking the commercial roles um, and, and certainly this role, um, for, for me, it was worth the risk. I mean, yes, the, the risk of failure is huge and it's very public. You are in the public eye. It's a listed company. I probably could have taken a slightly, you know, less ballsy um, but I, but I, I wanted to do the CEO in a listed business because that's when I'll really learn. You know, I haven't had that exposure to shareholders before, understanding about what drives the city, how investors are thinking. This whole, whole movement towards broader, longer term investment principles rather than the short term profit. You know, the, the sort of, you know, the real growth in, in ESG or environment, social and governance factors and being broader in the way that you think about business. So it's not just about making profit for this year, but actually where's the business going managing that and, and maximizing that without compromising the business in the longer term, for me has been really insightful, real learning. Um, and I think I've grown hugely in the two years you know, it's given me so much more insight. You know, even if I go on and do something, I'll go back and do a marketing role. Yeah. I think I would be a better marketeer as a result of all the business experience I've now got. So nothing's ever a total failure. You learn. And that if is things it. go well or badly, you learn. You will be better as a result. If I have learned something, then I have not failed. Completely. If if you don't, if you don't fail. You're never going to know where your boundary is. You know, you're never going to see what the, that end point, what's your end of your capability, because you're, you're almost too scared um, to kind of push it to that level. So, you know, and why not? You know, at the end of the day, um, I will do my best job. I will learn through it and it will make me a, you know, a more experienced person. Yeah, you have if you more more opportunity you know maybe you know the, the the next role that I would love to do non-exec work whether that's for you know business or whether that's for charity um sort of foundational work you know, that would be great because if I can give back a little bit to other businesses if my you know experiences of any help 
then I'll be grateful to share it, you know, and and work in that space. It'd be it'd be really interesting to see how I can support others. Absolutely. And, and it's 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 not all about the glory. It's not all about getting through that sort of winning line. Sometimes it's about just really understanding just how far you can push it and how you can learn through that. Absolutely. Fascinating. So um, that is all that those are all the questions I have for you. The final piece is really, um, you know, if, what advice would you give to a person that is coming up based on what you have learned? What are the, I guess, the three nuggets uh, that you, you, you've discovered that you would like to share with others? Um, I think the first one is reach out to others. I know I've talked a lot about that during the last um, hour. Uh, reach out to others and talk to people. There's always somebody who's been there and done it and, and seek advice. You can then, you don't have to follow the advice, but think about it and just reflect on it perhaps before you act and do what you're going to do or the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, I, I think the, the second area is don't wait, you know, seize the moment. Life is incredibly short and it goes so quickly you know you may never get that chance again so I think it's really important that people just you know don't wait for things to happen um you know be instrumental. yeah grab it just grab the opportunity you know things are instrumental Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Helen. That was really, really insightful. And we we'll hope we see you again. Um, thank you for your time. And we've learned so much. No and we'll problem. Delighted. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Michelle. Take care.